All right. We're live now. So, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Luis Pirit Santo, and I'm a co-organizer of Deep Learning Sessions Portugal. Uh, I'm really happy to welcome all of you to our first event of 2022. So, deep learning is changing at a fast pace. Everyone can clearly see it around us, changing the way we live our lives. It is present in our everyday products inside our homes, in our cars, and even our wearables. It is ubiquitous and keeps growing, and the deep learning community is growing along. Researchers, developers, scientists are joining together to explore the possibilities it opens. It is also undeniable that under the wide spectrum of deep learning, we can find many different trends of research. So to explore and debate this ever-changing nature of deep learning, we decided to host this round table. Uh, we'll, this, this event will have, uh, we'll, in this event, uh, we'll have a 15-minute discussion with our guests, and afterwards we'll have 30 minutes of uh, open Q&A. As usual, you can talk with other viewers through the YouTube chat, but this time we're trying something new to make the Q&A session more interesting. If you want to see your question answered, please go to Slido. Uh, the, the, the link is in the description. The password is Deep Learning Portugal, and there you may ask your questions and even vote in other questions uh, that you find interesting. So presenting our speakers and guests uh, of today, we have Hugo Penedones, uh, the co-founder of Inductiva Research Labs at Oporto and former researcher at DeepMind, Mari Figueiredo, who is a uh, machine learning researcher and distinguished professor at Instituto Superior Técnico and the head of the Lisbon Unit for Learning and Intelligence Systems, and also Pedro Bizarro. Pedro is one of the co-founders and the chief science officer of Pizai, one of the famous Portuguese unicorns. Thank you, uh, you three, for accepting this invitation, uh, for being here. Um, I would like to start our discussion by asking what can be the impacts of this ever-changing nature uh, of, this, of this research field um, and what, what are the advantages and disadvantages of this uh, nature and how do you deal with this in your daily lives as, research, as machine learning and deep learning researchers? We can start with Mario, uh, maybe. Okay, so hello, good afternoon. So thank you for the invitation for to take part in this uh, interesting discussion. It's a great pleasure to be here with Luis, with, uh, with, with Hugo and with Pedro. Let me just add something to my introduction. Otherwise, Pedro would, would, would probably uh, not like it. So because I'm also, I also have this uh, whole the, 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 the FIDSI chair of machine learning at IST, which is an endowed chair by FIDSI. It's a, it's, a, it's a great pleasure and honor to, to have that. And so I've been also collaborating with with Fitai in, in different ways. So we have this deeper connection <laughs> uh, between IST and 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 Pedro and and Fitai. So uh, so being uh, not very young now, I, I've seen the, the the several waves of this of, of this trend around uh, around neural networks and around deep networks. So when when the deep network uh, explosion happened in the early 2010, so 2012 with the, with the ImageNet uh, thing, um, I, I had already been working in computer vision for like a, at least 10 years or more than that, and and so it it was a big change. So there was a, a really big change in the way people approach things. Uh, to solve problems, namely in computer vision or, or, or in machine learning in general, and and and, uh, and so the explosion since then was absolutely uh, unbelievable. So it's uh, it's a very different world now in terms of, of research in this area, uh, for, for for many different reasons, uh, and, and and one of them is that uh, there was a there was sort of a split. I think it's I think one of the things that that is a very interesting trend was a, a very marked split between what you need to know to be able to work in machine learning and especially in deep learning uh, in terms of so in, in terms of mathematics and, and programming so the entry barrier 
in terms of, of mathematics became officially zero. You you actually can implement uh, some machine learning system without knowing any mathematics at all, which was completely impossible 20 years ago, uh, because everything was explained in terms of mathematics. Uh, and, and also in coding, because these systems are very complicated to code, you cannot code it from scratch. No one would be able to do it. Um, not even a professional, right? It, it would take a long time. But now it's very easy. You can have, you can have like an, a almost a hobbyist perspective and build your own whatever system at home. And so this 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 uh, this poses uh, of course lots of interesting challenges. Um, so so in in the question you were asking, what what kind of challenges does this pose for for me as a as a as professor had to teach things around these topics? It's pretty challenging because. It's very hard to choose what to teach and uh, and how to teach in a, in a manner that is uh, sustainable in the mid long term because you don't want to teach just something which is uh, the latest uh, fashion. But on the other hand, if you don't teach something that is recent and it's exciting, the students won't find it interesting. So there's this for me this 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 uh, which didn't exist before because because things moved slower. <clears throat> Another thing that changed a lot, is, and and uh, with uh, with uh, with uh, is the fact that, say, 15, 20 years ago, there was no interesting research or even developments in machine learning or and deep learning in companies, and now it's very different. Now there's lots of very advanced research in in, the, in machine learning in companies. So 20 years ago, it was very very uninteresting for an academic to collaborate with companies in Portugal. Now it's extremely interesting. It's it's actually that we have to 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 keep the pace. It's so the, because their people in companies are producing uh, um, state of the art results in their areas, and and also publishing in in, in the best conferences. So it's the, the the world changed a lot, and and mostly because of, of deep learning. I think it was a trend that it was due to deep learning because deep learning uh, because it's so powerful and so successful and it's so. It's so accessible in different in different ways that that changed the that kind of the, the, that the the way machine learning relates with the rest of the world. I'll, uh, I'll that would give time to. <laughs> yes. Uh, so Ugo and Pedro, do you want to yes. add something? Yes. I I can go next. Well, thank you for this invitation. It's a pleasure to be here with Mario and Pedro. Maybe I'll complement uh, Mario's answer with uh, this perspective, I think, which you also wanted to touch, which is the trends and all the buzzwords and competition for funding and so on. So I think having a lot of diverse ideas competing for attention or funding is overall healthy. What is perhaps dangerous is when there is one dominant idea or field which uh, suffocates all the others, right? And even neural networks suffered from that in the past where like support vector machines were more popular and so on and they were not getting enough enough funding and now it's, it's a bit the opposite. However, I believe we are in a slightly different regime and this is less dangerous now. Why? Because now we have things like archives. Everybody puts the preprints online and they have less dependence on having being approved or no by by reviewers and you even have open review systems so the likelihood of you know marginal ideas that are good not having enough visibility i think it's decreasing okay there's a lot of publications so you still have to find them but at least they will not be hidden so i think this is this is progress in terms of funding um there's also the aspect of companies right so in, in that aspect, uh, it would be risky to use buzzwords just to rebrand your company. Okay, we are an AI company, but in fact, there's no real substance behind. The risk would be, okay, investors are putting a lot of money on something that will under deliver, right? And in terms of academia, something similar could have happened in the past in these two AI winters in which maybe the community was over promising and under delivering and then you pass through a phase in which there's no funding because people are disappointed. However, again, in this aspect, I'm also very optimistic that we will not have like a, another AI winter anytime soon because deep learning and reinforcement learning and all the intersection of these fields and the tools that the community have are really delivering really. It's like, they are bringing a huge amount of value to the companies that use this. The research is very active. So we are not anywhere near hitting like a wall and say, wait, there's no more progress and we have to start from scratch. So that's a bit my perspective. Maybe 
I know if Pedro wants to add something. Yes, Pedro. Yeah, maybe I can I can say just a couple of things. That uh, by the way, thank you for the invitation and thanks for my fellow panelists and for the audience. Um, so, if the question is, is it hard that there's so much interest in buzzwords and 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 that the market and the the, the research is so frothy in a way? Well. There is some challenge, but I can tell you that it's much worse the reverse, right? It's much worse when <laughs> there's much fewer buzzwords and much fewer funding and interest. I actually um, seen lots of, of colleagues, researchers in other areas with much less funding and much less buzzwords. And just keeping going, it's, it's hard, keeping the motivation, hiring students, applying for grants. Uh, sometimes there's a, um, a winner takes all. Um, and there's lots of money and interest here, which kind of drives out the other areas. So I think overall, I think it's it's been very positive for, for the area, for, for AI, and even for computer computer science in general. And uh, it's touching many different areas. Uh, I think as, as many people know, I originally came from even databases. So, and and it's it's interesting to see a combination of, of AI with many other areas. Uh, I think maybe what is, and uh, touching what what Hugo said, what is maybe a little bit hard is that because the market is so frothy, so there's so much interest. Sometimes there's so much hype that uh, at least in, on the company side of things, we see completely inflated and exaggerated claims, right? And sometimes there's this peer pressure, market pressure to, to just overhype it even more, right? If everybody's saying they're awesome, what can you say more? You, you are extra awesome, super duper extra awesome, right? So, and, and claims become really outrageous and ridiculous sometimes. And and um, even sophisticated clients or, or, or sometimes engineers cannot distinguish many times. I, I posted the other day on Twitter a, a little questionnaire, just five questions about what can AI do, things that AI, for example, if, if it can translate as, as a, a normal adult, if it can classify uh, x-rays, things like that, just five questions. And, I, uh, and according to some survey, only 16% of people are able to, to get all the five questions right. So the, the misconception is very, very high. Um, and I think that's probably the, the biggest danger, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so let's go to a different question that is kind of related to what we've, we've been talking about, about uh, companies um, and the importance of companies in this uh, deep learning ecosystem. And let's talk about Portugal specifically. So my question is that is about um, we, we've been witnessing the surge of several new Portuguese unicorns uh, that are investing in AI. And we have public policies regarding a unicorn factory. Um, well, it's in discussion, but um, given that, how do you feel Portugal is doing in this, uh, in the deep learning uh, and more generally uh, artificial intelligence field? Do you think the investment is enough for companies and academia? Um, and what are the main uh, or the biggest obstacles you encounter while reaching your goal? Now we can start, for example, with Google. Okay. So I'll start by saying that I'm overall optimistic about Portugal. So like Mario was saying in the beginning, there is a big difference from, you know, Portugal 2022 and Portugal 2005, for example, when I finished my studies on informatics and computer engineering in, in, um, in Porto, in which you really had to ask yourself the question, okay, if I want to, uh, do a PhD or do research at the highest level or work in a very interesting company in Portugal, do I have a good place to go? And maybe there will be very few, like we have world-class researchers like Mario Figueiredo, but there was not much options. And in terms of uh, companies, probably there would be zero. Now we have Feedsai here, there's Anbabel, Farfetch, and our, ourselves now in Nutiva, in which you have research labs that are trying to do like world-class research. So. If you think about like a young, talented person now, the opportunities inside Portugal are much better than 15 or 20 years ago. So I'm, I'm optimistic. 
Now, if you ask, there's enough investment, I mean, probably not, right? In the sense that, uh, especially for universities, it's probably very hard to compete and hire the best uh, professors, right? Because they will not pay the same as the US or Switzerland and so on. However, even there, I think y y with the same budget, you probably can do more just by cultivating a, a culture of excellence, right? You, you still can improve the output, the academic output of your of your group if you have uh, good criteria to select people. In terms of uh, like unicorn factories and policies, I mean, it's good that people are, are thinking about this, but you, you need to be aware that this takes time, right? So if you think of uh, areas of the world like Silicon Valley or, or, or even European countries like Switzerland or the UK, they have like a 50 or 60 year tradition of having, you know, uh, good universities and ecosystem around that, startups, investment, venture capitalists and so on. Here, perhaps we have, I don't know, 15 years in, in which this started to build up. And you need to think that this goes through generations. So uh, the first uh, successful founders of companies that you have, we have here, Pedro from Fidzai, okay, they built a unicorn. This means that these people, these founders can now be mentors or investors or angel investors in other companies that perhaps can accelerate a little bit faster. In academia, it's the same, right? You have the first wave of people that went to do PhDs in the best places in the world, right? So FCT did a great job with the PhD grants. So they will be the next wave of uh, PhD advisors to the to new students, right? And uh, none of these things you can really accelerate and say, okay, I put my money in the, and the next week uh, it will be better, right? It takes time because it's, it's an effect of uh, people, right? And generations becoming mentors to the next generation. So I, I believe that we are now collecting the fruits of the first pioneers, right? That did this uh, 10, 15 years ago without any conditions. And now for people like, uh, I, now we are starting a startup now and many of us are, things are much easier than they had to face, they had to do 15 years ago. So I'm overall optimistic, but we have to realize it takes time, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mario, Pedro, do you want to add something? Yeah, no, well, not, not much in terms of investment from, from inside companies, I don't know, because I don't have the vision into what they're doing exactly in terms of how much they're investing. The, the clearly investing, um, well, I know Fidzai, I know a few other companies I've been collaborating with, like uh, Art Systems, for example. They're not exactly an AI company, but they're, they're just starting to use AI. They have a lot of AI people and a lot of machine learning people, although that, that's not how they started. Um, and and um, and and the other companies uh, in, in in Portugal, but in terms of of like Google touched several important problems. So it's it's currently it's very hard to attract the best students, the best master students, to attract them to to to, PhD, to becoming PhD students because it's simply not competitive. So recently, I heard about some young master students just finished, and uh, uh, we're discussing. Would you be interested in a PhD? And I, I realized that he was working part time, like two or three hours per day during his master's and getting a salary, which was about twice as what would be a, a PhD fellowship. So it's, it's no, and, and, and before, so the, the, again, I'm coming back to the end and Google already touched upon that point, which is the fact that nowadays there's a lot of interesting work. So if you're a very smart, young uh, computer scientist or engineer, and you want to do some kind of research slash development, because the, 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 the boundary between research and development is blurred nowadays in, in, in machine learning and in, in, in deep learning. And you, you, may, you may go to a company and you, you maybe find yourself doing very, very interesting work. So this idea that, okay, if you want to, if you want to make money, you go to a company, but it's gonna be boring. If you want to do interesting work, you stay in academia, but you're going to be poor. That that dichotomy is no longer there. So you may be you may go to a company and do really interesting work in the company. Uh, but it's still true that if you become a PhD student, you'll be poor at least for four years. Uh, and uh, and so that 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 makes it very hard. So for uh, so what we have to do is so we have to be competitive. We have to to create networks like uh, so the Lisbon unit of, of, of the LDS network. So we have to become uh, networked and, and try to co-supervise people with other schools because young people nowadays like to travel, they like to have experiences abroad. 
So it's, we already completely inside the Erasmus generation. Almost every math student at technical, well, not all of them, but a lot of them, had some some foreign experience. Sometime they spent some time somewhere, and so it, it's we we need to attract people from. We need to to play the game in the in the in the bigger market around the world, maybe at least in Europe, and not only try to attract local students, but try to attract local students from from everywhere, and try to pay them more attractive salaries it's impossible to compete with the, with the companies but at least uh to be a little more attractive you don't have to yes. to, to be poor to, to be a bit <laughs> yeah do you want to add something to maybe i can add from the the perspective of startups uh, uh funding has really increased dramatically uh it is public information if you go to the startup portugal site um, they have uh, what's called the, the deal room. It's a, it's a little page there that uh, summarizes the, the funding uh, that Portuguese startups have been getting. And uh, actually, I checked that a couple of days ago. And just in the last two years, so 2019 and tw uh, 2020 and 2021, the so last two years, Portugal got, I think, 1.5 billion in the funding in startups. Well, billion, American billion. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, that is more than uh, it, all the years combined since they started counting since 2010. So those last two years. So so the trend is really going up a lot. But I think as as Hugo was saying and and many others realized, we are still very very far away from like yeah. mm -hmm. Israel or London or, or Berlin or or, or or Silicon Valley. In in our office in Silicon Valley, um, I mean in our building. There were more unicorns in our building than in Portugal, right? in the building. <laughs> yes. Uh, and so sometimes we, we we don't even think about that because we only think about like the trillion dollar companies in the US, and Google and Facebook. But there's like hundreds, literally, of, of, of unicorn companies, like two, three, four billion dollar companies that nobody heard in Portugal. But they are more or less common there. So we are very far away from that time. But it, the, the, the trend, as, as the investor says, we don't look at the point, look at the trend, right? So the trend is great. Right? The trend is, is great, it's, it's, it's growing. Uh, and uh, as Hugo was saying, you see the, the, um, the founders and early employees investing in, in other companies. Just to put that number in context, so the, the budget of FCT, the, the from the San Francisco Technology, is about uh, I think 350 million or something a year. Yes. So it's about almost five times more. Well, it's two years, so it's like you know, 2.5. Yeah. So uh, I suggest that we go uh, into more specific into some trends sure. of deep learning. Uh, so I would start by asking. Um, I'm addressing this question to Pedro, but of course uh, I want to hear all of your comments. So about fairness. So fairness is an established topic of research nowadays. Explainability and interpretability are also widely considered important research areas. What are the main challenges on these and any other growing trends of research rela related to responsible AI or uh, AI for social good as well? What do you think about these trends? Well, first of all, I, I don't think it's as established as it should be. <laughs> I think we are just in the beginning, right? There's, it's maybe there's already tracks and, and a couple of conferences, but you don't see products, for example, in the market. You don't see yet a lot of impact uh, yet. Um, and actually, there's a, a big consortium in Portugal that is being proposed. Hopefully, it's approved with with a number uh, of um, of companies uh, involving and, and, and Babo and Talkdesk, also Finzai and a number of, of um, universities uh, in Portugal, which it gets, if it is approved, I think it's probably going to be the biggest uh, project in AI ever in Portugal, uh, uh, creating about 300 jobs and with, with grants for about 150 PhDs and master students. So it's really a, a big thing. And the focus is on responsible AI. So I, I feel that, no, it's not yet established. As, as you, it's just starting in, in my perspective. But what, what is missing? Um, many things, uh, for example, real world data sets and, and tasks. 
There are, there are some real world data sets and tasks, but they are most of them are too simple, too small, right? They are as old and others that are that are famous, but we're talking many times, like uh, 1,000, 2,000 examples is really, really tiny uh, for, for the real world. And I think there's also a lot, a, a lack of understanding of what setups and conditions um, state of the art explainability and fairness methods really work well. There's lots of stuff in papers, not so much stuff yet, like real field experiments. Does it really work? Because one thing is a, a paper like experiment or Kega like experiment, the other is okay, let's combine. The entire system, which is maybe a machine learning model or, or a few of them with maybe some rules and maybe some people in the loop and some uh, uh, shifts and, and distribution shifts overall. What happens to fairness? What happens to uh, to explainability? We, we, for example, we measured um, many experiments and it's really hard because, for example, the, the um, analysts that are looking to explanations after a while, they maybe they start getting bored with explanations. They, they look too much the same, or or they start trusting them a little bit less. So there's effects that have to do with time or the sequence of explanations, and uh, many things that we see in the literature don't actually work so well in practice. For example, we 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 compared Shep explanations versus, versus line explanation versus random explanations. R random, but uh, but um, possible explanations, not, not trash, but that could be an explanation, but random out of the features that have uh, a high, high, high score, you just select random features. And the, the random features produce better results, right? Better than like state of the art line and, and, and chef. So, and, and these are the, the things that I think we are still missing, right? How, how do these things really work in practice with the real data sets, with real people in the loop after two, three, four, five hours of looking to those explanations, the in, the out, what happens? And I think we are mm -hmm. still very far from having something that is really representative of fairness and responsibility and mm -hmm. explanation. Yeah, uh, Ugu and Mario, do you have something to add to uh, regarding responsible AR or AI for social good uh, yeah. that you think it's important to mention? Well, I can add something. Um, so uh, at Indotivo, we don't have such strong concert, concerns on around fairness because we don't deal with data from people with deal uh, or users with deal with data from physical systems. But uh, there is a, an interesting connection. Uh, but I mean, f well, first comment, uh, uh, which relates to what Mario said in the beginning, because the barrier to entry to do machine learning decreased so much, it's very easy now for people that have no idea on what they are doing to train a, a machine learning model to predict something. And there was this outrageous papers a few years ago predicting, you know, criminality propensity from pictures of people and these kind of things which uh, in terms of engineering you can do because it's like data in and prediction out and so on, but it, it has no, it makes no sense at all. And most people that know a bit about machine learning would probably not do this, but because the barrier of entry is so low, uh, some people did it. But in, ter in our field, which is more applying uh, machine learning to science, there's actually a, an interesting thing about explainability. So, even in, in our field, it is interesting. So you could imagine you have a, a, a physical system and you want to predict how it, it evolves. You can train a neural network to make predictions of the next step, right? But this would be a black box model that doesn't bring much insight. But there is even a subfield, uh, which is called more symbolic learning, in which you actually try to derive the, like the equations, differential equations that describe the system which is much like, you know, science, physicists do, like, I don't know, Kepler, when he observed the planet, traje pl the trajectories of planets, you know, you could come up with a table to predict the next, you know, next day where it will be, and it would be a huge table, but this would not be very interpretable. But once, once you have, you understand the physics of it, you can distill it to, you know, a few, a few equations. So this is also interesting in, in, our, in our field of scientific machine learning to actually learn equations from data.
Yeah. So they are explainable. Uh, and Mario, do you want yes. to? Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm not an expert on explainability or fairness. Uh, I've been, I started looking at these topics uh, precisely because I started collaborating with Fidzai and uh, namely you know, uh, co-supervising people. So uh, the little I know I learned by, from this collaboration and because I have to study to, to keep the pace. Uh, so there's a, in Fidzai, there's a Pedro, Pedro Saleiro who is an expert on, on, um, on that topic. So I've been learning a lot from him. Uh, but I think it's, it's, of course, it's a very relevant topic. So some, I think it's important maybe to decouple um, explainability from fairness because I don't think it's mandatory that you have explainability to have fairness and to have confidence. Uh, so they, they, they can be studied. Of course, they're, they're related. They're not orthogonal issues. And, uh, and, and sometimes, so there, and another topic, which is how do you, how do you build systems on which you trust? So, so fair, trustness, tr trust, trustworthiness, um, fairness, and explainability, they're all related, but they're all sort of independent and you can study them separately. Uh, although, of course, they intersect. So there's, there's a trend. So for example, this is very, uh, probably one of the number one researchers in fairness and, uh, and in, in the world, which is Maurice Hart, was just hired back from Berkeley to Europe. So Max Planck is starting an institute exactly on social foundations of computation. And they hired Maurice Hart to be the head so there's a there's a push in, in in different countries to to, of course there's also a counter push. I'm not gonna say names, but there are people who say that ah we don't need uh, fairness. Uh, it's it's uh, it's it's not a very relevant topic. Um, so yeah, but it uh, so it's it's a very long so explainability. Well, we could that this the discussion would take us too 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 deep, but I think explainability is. Fairness, I would say that fairness is probably an undervalued um, topic, which is really important. Explainability probably is not so important in, in my view, although it's important because it may be, it may be a tool to, 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 to study fairness, but it, it's, not, it's not mandatory. So uh, I just, in, in this, if, we, if you allow me 30 more seconds, so I recommend that you, if anyone is interested, a very, very short sci-fi novel novelette it's like it's one page it takes like five minutes to which is called catching crumbs from the table which is actually published in in, in nature the journal nature uh, 22 years ago almost 2000 and the idea was that the, the, the key idea is that in 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 some future so there was these meta intelligent a agents which which are super intelligent more intelligent than humans and they so it could be like the future of inductiva and now they took science they they do science and and now science in that in that era science is beyond the understanding of humans. It's just too complicated, and so the I think the only fear is this because science is a uh, is and and what Indutiva is doing so using machine learning for science, we run the risk of 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 not understanding exactly what uh, what the computers are doing and and so we need to define and so in in that uh, hypothetical uh, future. Humans now are limited to doing hermeneutics, which is to try to understand what the machines are doing. Uh, but there was no, no no ethics problem because the humans are, are had comfortable lives; they just didn't understand science. That's all. Yeah. And so there's we, we shouldn't go that far, but uh, we should. I think we shouldn't put too much stress on explainability. Yeah, uh, taking taking just uh, I'm going to take that note and ask you. Um, well, I'm addressing this to Ugu, um, but of course I want everyone to add your comments. But well, recently DeepMind announced their work on using AI to help mathematicians find patterns and conjectures to guide their work. And we were talking about this machines doing or helping at least in science. Well, uh, it was an extreme. Um, and what well what do you think is the role of ai in scientific discovery in maths physics drugs discovery astronomy what are the advantages and disadvantages of having ai helping us uh, to discover these new things yes thank you yeah, so I, I worked for a few years at DeepMind and indeed I, I, I keep having to write uh, congratulatory mails to my ex-colleagues and say whoa what you did is really inspiring and just in the last year there were there were a few very relevant papers right so 
There was Alpha Fold 2, so I was actually in, in the Alpha Fold 1, the first paper, but uh, the Alpha Fold 2 was super impressive. So predicting the structure of proteins just from the amino acid sequence and having such high accuracy was amazing. There was a paper about whether now casting, so this is a new area in which you, you like try to predict, you know, will it rain in this neighborhood of London 27 minutes from now? It's like very high precision and short term predictions. They did machine learning for this. There was a paper on uh, uh, modeling uh, quantum systems with machine learning. So this is an area that we are also interested at in, in the Tiva. So you want you have the Schrodinger equation that describes uh, matter at the smaller scale, and you have these fields of physics like density, functional theory, the very elaborated, and so on. And now there was a recent paper by DeepMind using machine learning to to achieve state of the art in this in this field, uh, which was very impressive. And finally, the one you mentioned, which was machine learning more for pure mathematics. In that one, what well, I remember that they had started re this research while I was there a few years ago, and uh, the, they were working even on knot theory, which is something very abstract. But um, what amazed me, it was not, not just a purely uh, machine learning result, right? It was not that they trained the model and they were able to predict something. It was more like it worked in tandem with uh, pure mathematicians and guided a bit their intuition to actually prove the humans actually and prove results, right? So this was very interesting and su even surprising for me. So if you, if now you think about what is the trend, right? So at Indutiva, we are betting on this area, right? But uh, uh, the way we see it at the moment is more like, okay, uh, for many of the physical systems, there is an understanding. So you know the physical laws. But simulating the system or uh, optimizing some thinking, some parameter about the system or even controlling something tends to be very expensive computationally. For example, I mentioned the Schrodinger equation. It's, it's like the, you have to deal, uh, things increase exponentially with just adding more particles, right? So you, for example, you have to find the eigenvectors of, of a matrix. If you if you have one or two electrons, you add more one electron and the matrix now it's 100 times bigger or a thousand times bigger and it, it really scales slowly. Oh, I think. Oh, Mario just think Mario. left. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and so we see this pattern, which is uh, for some problems, you have uh, even a complete mathematical understanding of, of uh, how it works and how it described. But uh, simulating at a scale that is relevant for our applications, it's super slow. And the same we can say about fluid dynamics, it's another field we are interested on, or even problems in mechanical engineering and so on. It's things that uh, you wish you could simulate much faster, but you can't with classical methods. And the opportunity here is you, to use machine learning to accelerate this kind of uh, physical simulations by a, a couple of order of magnitudes or, or, or more. And this opens a new range of applications, right? You could think of, okay, now you can do better materials or direct design because you understand uh, quantum mechanics and you can simulate things faster. Or you can do better uh, clean energy production because now you can model wind or waves uh, or even uh, you have a, a tokamak with the plasmas and you want to do nuclear fusion, clean energy. It's another fluid you have to model. So all of these things, if you were able to simulate physics much faster and deal with much uh, bigger systems, there's a, you know, a huge value added to the world. So that, that's where, where we are betting hard that the next decade will, will lead us to. Uh, yeah, so Mario and Pedro, uh, there's some comments on this, uh, like the role of AI in scientific discovery um, Mario already told us that maybe, uh, well, told us this creepy story. <laughs> uh, I suppose it's kind of frightening. Yeah, but not, well, not 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 in the, in this direction that we were mentioning. <laughs> I think I think it's one of the it's one of the trends. The thing I had in my mind when if we talk about trends for the next decade, yeah. it's definitely the 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 expansion of the use of AI machine learning in, in scientific applications. Um, and I don't think there's an explainability problem there because. Mm -hmm. uh, you also do not really understand as well as simulate, a simulate so, so, some, some numerical, really big numerical thing that runs on an HPC on, on, a, on a high performance computer. 
to simulate the fluid dynamics of atmosphere or something. You don't, you know the equations, but mm -hmm. you don't really understand the details of what's going on. So you, you don't care because you know the principles. That's what matters. Mm -hmm. you, the word, I think, the word understanding and explaining are very loaded. And it's uh, when you say explain, what do you mean explain? So you need to explain very well what you mean by explain and and <laughs> uh, and what you mean by understand. Sometimes. We think we understand things just because we're used to them, right? It's not because so. In the I don't really know what understand means. Mm -hmm. So, but but this is a bit a uh, so. Word. By the way, Mario Figueiredo is a co-organizer of a fantastic seminar at IST with yes. like world-class speakers every week talking about uh, machine learning for physics, mathematics. So and vice versa. Yeah, yeah. We have a very nice uh, talk tomorrow by I forgot his name. That's a shame. I shouldn't say. I shouldn't have said it. Mm -hmm. Next week, and next week we have Anders Hansen. If you're interested in optimization, you should attend next week because it will show some really, really surprising results about uh, computational yeah. barriers for optimization okay, and some and failures of AI, some catastrophic failures of AI due to those problems. It's a, it's really interesting. It's a really fascinating talk. I, I recommend yeah. it. So next, so that one week from tomorrow at five. Yeah. We'll share so, but I think so. Yeah. So, so just yeah. just in a few seconds. So, I think this trend of, of using machine learning and AI for science will continue, in in the, exactly in the direction that Google said. But there's also the, the reverse trend. So, using uh, science, especially physics, to help understand AI. So that's another trend. So there's a lot of people trying to use statistical mechanics and uh, and other areas of physics. So that's what the talk tomorrow will do. So using advanced and sophisticated physics. Specifically, for, well, probably the, the the current trend, the current hottest trend there is is statistical physics, thermodynamics, normalizing group, normalization groups, all these sophisticated mathematical tools from from physics to try to understand, for example, deep learning. Yeah, that's another trend. So there's there's a, there's a synergy. It's not only machine learning for science, also some areas of science to help understand machine learning. Do you want to add like a short note on this topic? So we can move on. No, I, I agree with uh, with the points that I think it's only going to grow more, and also agree with with Mario that explainability is not necessarily needed for for this area, and and uh, also specifically on the point that Mario made of what what is the the meaning of the word understand, and I am gonna recommend to you if you have not read the the book Noise uh, by by Daniel. Kahneman, also the, the author of Think Fast and Slow, is, is a great, great book. Um, and he talks also about the meaning of understand in the, in the context of people making forecasts, for example, uh, recommending to hire someone or recommending a sentence to a criminal. And, and because when people are doing that, they are trying to understand is this person going to do a good job or is this person going to, to repeat some criminal offense and they compare the judgment of people with the judgment of uh, AI systems doing the same job and and it's interesting that uh, sometimes people don't really understand they 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 only understand in re retrospect they, they they find an explanation that kind of kind of fits but is not necessarily a true one it's just and and, and many times we you look at the situation and regardless of what happens, it can happen A or it can happen B, and you find an explanation for that quickly, right? But but you could not possibly have both explanations be true, but but you as a person, you, you will create an explanation on the fly and you will accept that as correct, even if it's completely fake. So so yes, the, the understand word is very, very loaded. Um, yes, yeah, so. Uh, let's jump to uh, another topic that just grow, uh, grew a lot in 2020, that is transformers. So it seems that transformers that have been dominating in natural language um, also have entered and conquered a bit the, the area of computer vision in 2021. Um, and I've actually been attempting to generalize to other kinds of uh, inputs and outputs with, for example, Perceiver AU. Um, well, do you think Transformers are a trend to stay and they'll stay for long years? Or are these more general and uh, don't 
uh, and we don't need uh, inductive biases or in short, is this really a case of uh, Sutton's bitter lesson that we can kind of uh, just summarize that with greater computational power comes less responsibilities for the researchers or uh, what, what are your thoughts on transformers and their power? Are they dominating everything? Uh, well, I, we can start with Mario. Yeah, that's a, that's a difficult question. Predicting the future is hard. Um, so yeah, so transformers, I'm not an expert on transformers. Let me begin by saying this. Um, so transformers sort of gave the idea that you can get away without uh, inductive biases, for example, for vision that you, you don't need to, 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 to hardwire equivariance. Uh, because that's not uh, because transformers will will perform well even with that uh, with that bias, um, but there's more recent work. I don't know if you've seen this. There's very very recent work. I think it's what day is today? It's the day before yesterday, January tenth, twenty two. Uh, it's a very interesting paper called Confnet for the twenty twenties, uh, and what they they, they show they, they they take a classical ResNet. Uh, from, from 2015, and they kind of tweak it and fine tune it, and they they show that by actually doing some improvements, they can outperform uh, transformers uh, with with a, and and in a more efficient way. So we are using with with less with less uh, mega flops, but with slightly better performance. So I don't know. So I, I don't think. So the, I think it's more important. Coming back to this bitter lesson. Uh, what is really, really relevant is how the performance scales with the amount of data. Not specific points on this curve, but so probably transformers uh, at, at, the, at, the, at the typical data set, training data set size that you, that you that are used today. If you're not in a very high, uh, if, you, if, you have, if you are in a very high data regime, so transformers will be able to learn almost everything there is to learn, and so they will kind of learn the invariances that are in the data. But if you are in the lower uh, data regime, of course, and, and the lower you are, the more important, well, like Sutton uh, wouldn't argue against this, I think, then the, the, the inductive biases and, the, and the sort of a little bit of engineering and trying to engineer the invariances that you know exist directly into the system will, 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 will prove useful. So I think there is room for for both types of solutions. It depends on on what regime is relevant for your application. If you uh, and and it depends on on whether you think that imposing those those invariances and though are is really important or not. Uh, and and so so I think there's a, there's a, there's a trade off, and and essentially you need to look at and how things change and what in the future. So there's another paper where I think it's very relevant. I think it was the best paper award that I CML, I think, by Sebastian Bubeck about this, this essential smoothness uh, idea, um, which is also very relevant because he, he, he shows that, well, it shows why we need over-parameterization, although it's, not in, it's not, nothing related to, to transformers at all. And he shows that we are essentially, all, all the networks today are still very, very, very small. Uh, so for, for ImageNet, he did some some uh, kind of prediction that you would need something of the order of five billion parameters, if I'm not wrong, uh, to really be at the top, at the, at the best possible performance. Actually, it's a negative result. It's not a positive result. He said it, it would not be able to be at the top performance with less than that number of parameters. Uh, so the networks are, are still not too big in terms of the, of the theory, at least from, from this prediction. Um, and and so yeah, so I, I'm I'm sorry I couldn't give a more yeah. definitive answer, but yeah, as a, yeah. as a researcher as a scientist, it's important to be able to say I, I don't know I don't yes, I don't know. Yes, of course, yeah, just and some random thoughts. <laughs> Hugo and Pedro, yes, Pedro, you want to say something? Well, I can also say that I'm not an expert on transformers, but I'm an expert on bitter lessons. <laughs> 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 so I, I actually, I actually would maybe uh, summarize the, the bitter lesson maybe in a little uh, different way. Uh, I think, I think the lesson is so 
we as scientists are trying to encode our knowledge somehow in the agents or in the models or, or in whatever, right? And, and uh, the, 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 I think the, the bitter part is that many times in the short term it pays off, right? It's, we get yeah. a little bit of an advantage. But then we, we get a plateau in the long term, right? And, and, but we are like mentally invested on that component of putting the, the human knowledge there. And then someone comes from the side, right? And, and are just trying to improve some other, which, which looks almost like a technical aspect of, of the problem, like search or, or algorithmic speed or something. And then they just blow the, the, the performance of the model. And that's the bitter lesson because it, it's in the end, oh, but I'm trying to combine the human knowledge with, uh, with machine learning and someone comes here on the side, they, they, they don't understand the problem at all and they just, and it doesn't matter, right? So that's that's a bit of a lesson, and and uh, we've gone through that at Fizai a number of times, right? We've we've gone through situations of like, like let's try to build better features, let's try to feed these features to the random forest or whatever, and then we we just improve the system to feed more data or to to move to to a network and and start getting better and better results. Um, so I I feel that in uh, maybe I would just change slightly what Mario said in, in the in the part of not improving just the, the, the processing of data, but maybe the, the entire time, not just the data, but the entire time, for example. So the, it's improving the overall uh, investment of, of person hours in a sense, not, not, not just the data, yeah, for example. Um, at at FITZAI, one of the reasons we, we start using deep learning was because, of course, it saves the engineering piece of right of, of really understanding the problem but it also saves storage right because if i if i if i was using um random forest actually boost like gbm i need the features there for for the model to to classify and in in our world that's typically hundreds of features for millions and millions of of accounts so we're talking about uh really gigantic amounts of data sets to, to store and, and update and classify and maintain in real time. So the state management is just in, insane. Uh, uh, hundreds of computers to maintain that. And, and with deep learning, we simplified it a lot. So the, the amount of state to keep in real time, uh, it's much, much less. So that's one, one big benefit, uh, for example. So, uh, and I see that, that trend playing well. So if I don't need to to do the features, and if I don't need to store them because there's no features to store, right? There's just some a network state to, to keep track of. Um, that also is also going to to speed up my return on investment, right? I'm helping an end customer to have a model faster. Um, so I I think um, I, I I've gone through the bitter lessons uh, a, f a few times and 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 got smarter on the other side. Of, okay, okay, let's we need to improve the entire system, and I, I think that also feeds well into this data centric and ML ops world where we are now, where that part is also important to to make it work well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so maybe I'll just add something quickly and then we you can move to maybe that question. But yeah, so there's one nice blog post that I recommend, which is like transformers are graph neural networks, which is kind of the way I like to see it. So uh, so transformers came up in the field of natural language processing and um, there didn't seem to be a, a big connection with graphs there. But in fact, uh, if you have a sentence of N words and you have this self-attention mechanism, you can see it as every word being connected to every other, it's like a dense graph, and you are learning the weights on how they relate to each other, right? So transformers are really just a specific instance of graph neural networks, and then maybe they have some tricks on top of it, like multi-heads and normalization and so on. So I don't know if this will go away, but for sure, this field of what is now called geometric deep learning, this is here to stay, right? Because this yeah. is really the first time, I guess, that there's really some mathematical principles in which you can follow kind of a blueprint of geometric deep learning and derive new architectures that have the variances or equivariances that you, that you wish for, like kind of deriving a convnet from first principles. Or, for example, we are just finishing a, 
a research paper now that we'll submit soon in which we have an equivalent neural network that is good to deal with matrices and permutations of rows and columns, which uh, August, one of our talented young mathematicians, he derived this basically just, okay, I want this property to hold and I write a new neural network architecture that will have it. So this is a completely new way of doing deep learning compared to before in which uh, people had some intuitions and they came up with an architecture that kind of captured this, but they, they didn't really derive it from first principle. So this I think is here to stay. And very quickly, just regarding the bitter lesson, I think that there are two things, right? If you are a researcher like Sutton, which is optimizing for, okay, I want my algorithms to be future proof and I want to be correct in 30 years from now. It makes a lot of sense to bet on things that scale well with computation. Like he says, learning and search are the two kind of things that scale very well. The more computation you add, the better these things will do. But you are not always in that regime that you can wait that much, right? For example, neural networks have been around for decades and even Q-learning is an, an algorithm from 88. And, you know, DQN that came up in 2013, 14, it's just a couple of tricks on top of th these two things to make the training stable, right? But for 30 years, we didn't have enough hardware to train this properly, right? So even though the results were there, you know, you have a lot of applications that you want to use in real life and industry and, and so on that will, uh, in that, in the present, will benefit from some human knowledge and they, they will achieve a bit better. So I don't think you can completely discard and just do the future proof thing, even though you might be right in the, <laughs> in the future. But, you know, as we go, we want to have applications that work the best possible, even if they have to include some, um, yeah. some human knowledge. Yeah. yeah. Let me do that if I can, uh, five, five yeah. seconds. So I think this point is extremely important that, that we made this example, because uh, I think the last, and, and it, it goes back all the way to like 1920s and 30s physics, which is invariances and equivalences are almost everything. Um, and and it, then the lesson appears again and again. Once you understand what are the invariances that are relevant for your problem, it's halfway solved. Yeah. And it, it may be the key to solving problems like fairness, because if you if you impose the, great, the right type of invariance, you want I want my decisions to be invariant to this feature of of, of, the, of the examples of the samples of the people, whatever. And if you can you have a solid way of imposing invariances, then yeah, yeah, it, it, it half solved. Paper coming out soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, uh, I um, I think we should move to the Q and A uh, because well, we're past the ninety minutes that we we expected. Um, so. Uh, I have some questions and I recall uh, everyone, our audience that uh, is watching us. Mm -hmm. If you want your question to be answered, please just enter Slido um, and just ask your question. Or if you think there's one question there that it, it is really important and you want, want it to be answered, please vote for it uh, because we're starting from the top. And the first question there is, does it still make sense to get a PhD? <laughs> well, that's a good question. <laughs> Who wants to start? Well, I, 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 can, I can start. Yes. Uh, and I think that's a, a super personal decision. Right? Mm -hmm. I don't do PhD because your father or mother wanted to do or because you think there's a reputation in that. There is, but you should not do it because of that. Do it if you if you feel it's right, um, and if you want, uh, and, and and if you're prepared to spend four, five, six years on 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 something, and sometimes it's it's very hard and very lonely. Um, from my perspective as an employer, um, I value PhDs. Right? I, I I I value PhDs. And uh, I, I even support PhDs. We even pay tuition for people at least I doing PhDs and even support people at least I living for PhDs. And actually, even this week, I was writing recommendations letters for people at least I to, to go to PhD programs. And last year, we did the same. So we, we totally believe that uh, you are able to achieve something different in a PhD that 
uh, without one. Maybe you, you, it, not so easily you can get. You can get there maybe, but not so easily because there's, there's a structure a, a, around it. Um, but of course, you need to to weigh what is more important for you. Clearly, if you're going to spend four or five years in a PhD, clearly you're not going to spend those four or five years progressing in a in a big company and maybe doubling, tripling, um, maybe even more your salary, right? Maybe you can have a person, uh, two people with the same type of capabilities and one is, I don't know, making one salary at the university and the other is making like eight times more, 10 times more in a company in London that, that is possible today, right? But not everybody prefers the money, right? Not everybody prefers that. Some others would prefer the, the, the mental challenge and, and the, the understanding something more deeply and contributing in a different way. Yeah. All right. Well, I totally agree with, with Pedro. It's, it's first and foremost a personal decision. It depends on what are your plans for your life, right? And uh, so the PhD is an opportunity to spend four or five years, or three, or typically four or five, going really deep into something and showing that you can that you can contribute to with new knowledge in a very unconstrained way. So it, you can also do it in a in in a company, but not probably. Uh, I, I have no experience working in companies, but I'd say that the time constants of companies are much shorter. So you, but a, a company that is here to stay, like like Fidzai, has things happening at different time scales. So there's some things for tomorrow, other things for next month, other things for next six months, and other things for next year. And and so I think there's in, in a company that does new stuff like Fidzai does, that, that innovates and develops their own methodologies and at, at, which are at cutting edge of, of the knowledge in the area. They there's there's room for everybody. There's room for people with PhDs and there's room for other people. Because it's a multi-scale, it, it's a multi-scale organization, multi-scale at different from different angles, multi-scale in time too, and so they need people who, who have this long-term view, and maybe it's good to hire people with PhDs who had this experience of going deep, and 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 can 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 handle the uncertainty, and not even knowing if there's a, if it's a good idea to go that way or not, uh, and and people who, who have to deal with the the, the, the shorter-term challenges. Yeah. So yes, but I think so. Okay, so maybe I can add to that. I'm actually a PhD dropout. I didn't finish my PhD in Switzerland, so I have a funny story. But yeah, it, it's a personal decision, obviously, right? In my case, I was my life satisfaction index was changing too much, and I decided I I, I needed a break. But in the end, I, I I realized that I still like to do research, and I ended up doing research in you know very good places without a PhD. So my comments there are are, are twofold. So one, like these big tech companies like, you know, Google, Microsoft and so on, they will mostly not hire because you have a PhD. They will rely mostly on their recruiting process, right? Because otherwise, you know, there's a lot of people that have PhDs, but that will not pass the interviews. And you have a lot of people that are really good and they will still pass it. And it's, it doesn't matter, right? If they don't have it. For example, at DeepMind, I can give two examples. One of the two lead authors of AlphaFold it was uh, my colleague, both at Microsoft and at DeepMind. He doesn't have a PhD, he's a brilliant person. And one of the lead authors, uh, the lead engineer basically at, of AlphaGo and Mu0 and AlphaZero and so on, he's, he, I don't think he even has a master. I think he has a bachelor in computer science. He's like a brilliant person and he was in all these high impact publications. So I think what is important from a PhD it's the experience you get, right? You have to see it as a, as a training process, right? You are, it's, it's elementary school for researchers, right? So I think the right way to approach it, and perhaps I didn't have this in the beginning, it's not like, oh, I have a PhD and I'll have a brilliant result here. You have to see it, okay, this is the beginning of what could be a decade, you know, three decade long career in research. And your PhD is just an intensive learning uh, period in which you can absorb a lot of, of material because you are fully devoted to that. But having said that, this now uh, can start to happen in companies, right? So for example, at Indutiva, we are hiring a lot of people that came fresh, fresh from masters and the experience they are having, or if this happens at DeepMind as well, it's, we hope to say it's like a bit like PhD, but only better in the sense that, okay, they are getting accelerated 
like they would do in a PhD, but it's in a more professional in environment in like we have better software engineering practices, code reviews, automated tools, and they work more as a team than typically would do in, um, mm -hmm. a, in a lab, in academia, in which often, I don't know, I don't want to generalize, but often each PhD student is very solitary in their trajectory, in their research. And uh, in some uh, industrial research labs, these young people, they can be interacting with a lot more people and changing projects and moving around according to their presence. So in that sense, it can be a better experience to them. They might learn perhaps even faster and they are not having to deal with this trade-off as also, okay, I'm, I'm putting on hold my career and my income and so on uh, because I want to learn more. Now it's possible to have best of both worlds, right? You, you, you are progressing in your, in your career, you are learning fast, and you can be less isolated. Having said that, I mean, it's still fantastic, right? We also uh, give value to people with PhDs. We recruit people with PhDs because they already went through that experience of publishing, of learning, going deep into subjects. Whereas the people we recruit with masters, they are brilliant and they have the talent, but they are still uh, taking those steps, right? Which the PhDs already went through. So that's my... Yeah. There's only one reason why which which makes mandatory to have PhD if you have that in your future, which is if you want some if you want to consider the hypothesis of becoming a, an academic, then for that you need a PhD. Yeah. There's no other way around it. Yeah. So I have another question. It is the, uh, regarding the interaction between academia and companies. How are companies help? Uh, how companies help and fund research? Can researchers hold positions at both places, for example, at Pizzai? Well, that, that, that already happened a few times. For example, we have a, a person who was a full-time employee at Pizzai, and he was also uh, an invited professor at the University of Porto. Um, and we already had that situation a couple of times, so it's, it's common. I don't... I actually see it with good eyes. I, I think it's mm -hmm. great if a person is, uh, and if they want to work full time, whatever, if they can, awesome. If they don't, they can also negotiate part time positions. That also happened. They were working 80% or 60% of the time at Fidzai. Um, I think it's great if there's a bridge, a connection to, to academia. I think there's lots of talent there. In terms of funding, we, we are trying to, to fund as much as we can. So we have a relationship, a funding relationship with, with IST and also with the University of Coimbra. Um, Pedro, we stopped. We're silent, Pedro. Yeah, we stopped for hearing you. No. no. Just after you said Coimbra. Yeah. <laughs> No. No. Yeah. Um, the, well, Hugo and Mari, do you want to to add something while Pedro? Yeah, there is a there's a when 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 people ask me that, I immediately think of uh, probably one, well, not probably, uh, surely one of the most brilliant Portuguese researchers in in AI machine learning, André Martins. Who is a, he has a double position. He has a position at actually has a triple position because he has a double appointment at IST at the at, at, at Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering and also at the Computer Science Department. And he's also had the research at Anbado. I don't know how he can do all three to get all two, <laughs> but he, he can. So there, there's there's nothing there's nothing wrong, and and he's doing uh, world class research, and teach, and and contribute to the company. So it's it's possible. It's not possible in all areas. So this is specific probably nowadays of machine learning. Mm -hmm. and maybe it would not be so easy in other areas of engineering, um, but but because it would not be so easy to find companies that are doing research that is also relevant from an academic point of view. Mm -hmm. but, but we also, can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But we also have people doing a PhD in a different area. For example, we have a, a, a researcher. She, she was working at FITZAI in our research department doing machine learning, and she was actually doing a PhD in, in statistics uh, and had nothing to do with the work of FITZAI. And for me, that was also okay. She, she could do it. Um, so no, no questions with that. 
Um, yeah, so at Innovative, we are still a small group, but we are super open to this, yeah. So <laughs> we'd love to have more uh, people in with uh, big positions at uni universities. Yeah. And by the way, we allow, so we have a uh, funding for people to invest on their own training. They can go to conferences on their care, train more, mm -hmm. whatever, product management or whatever they want. And actually, they can use that funding to pay the tuition if they want. If they are doing a PhD or a master's, they, they use that, that internal funding for, for training for that. Yes. So another question, what is the trend for salaries in deep learning job? It's, it's good. It's good. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's a good trend. It's growing, right? <laughs> uh, as, as far as I'm, I, I, I'm informed. Um, I mean, joke, jokes aside, um, so, I mean, there's so many um, salaries going up that have nothing to do with deep learning, right? So you, you don't need to to say it's deep learning is the only thing that I want to do. For example, we, we see salaries going very high, very quickly, for example, in data visualization, nothing to do with, with deep learning, or good product managers. Right. Um, so I think then maybe because of COVID and working from home and, and remote work, um, I, I think the market is is very aggressively uh, increasing the salaries. That's that's good for for some, maybe not so good for others. But clearly, the the trend overall in technology is, is, is salaries are growing. If if you are good in what you do. Deep learning, product management, data visualization, cloud, QA, security, ops. I mean, all the companies are essentially uh, higher, higher, higher. It's not just Fizzi or Inductive, it's Talkdesk, it's Unbubble, it's Hot Systems, it's FastFed, it's so many companies hiring external companies, Cloudflare coming to, to Portugal, BMW, uh, yeah. critical software. So there's literally thousands of new jobs every year in Portugal for, for high-tech people. Yeah. yeah. So there are good per perspectives on <laughs> yeah. uh, on deep learning jobs. So uh, I think we can move to another question. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have a question that is, isn't deep learning now at the peak of inflation? What can we expect in terms of five to 10 years from now? And like slim weightless networks is just, uh, the question and uh, just right. it depends on what you mean by deep learning. Uh, so I think when interesting, I think when 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 we discussed uh, what kind of topic we would uh, discuss, and you mentioned these nine thousand submissions of, of papers to New Rips of last year, right? Nine thousand submissions. So an interesting trend is to notice that uh, at New Rips there were uh, the last time, so two thousand twenty one, there were eight invited talks, and only one was about deep learning. So all the others are not about deep learning. So deep learning is kind of becoming almost like a, a technology that's kind of established. There's a lot of research still, but it's not. It's not not. It's not new, right? It's not. It's it's not. Uh, so there are other areas of machine learning which are more exciting in terms of, and growing faster nowadays. And deep learning is sometimes deep learning is used in so in those problems as a as a building block to solve some specific problem, like approximate a function or learn some dependency V or there. Or, but uh, so from my view, it's the, there is a, it's probably a peak in that sense of research, but it's not going away because it's it's essentially, it's it's a, it's a fundamental tool for, for processing data. Mm -hmm. So uh, no. yeah, the, the, some Hugo and Pedro, do you have any comment on? I, I agree with that. I think it's a very good summary. Cool. Uh, so uh, next question is uh, well is related to geometric deep learning, and I think we touched that. So uh, I'll move to another one. I think you already explained your opinion on what is the what are the benefits of geometric deep learning in finding new and better architectures. Uh, so. I'll uh, I'll just put that one aside, um, and I'll move to one that is just like that. Tools like hyperparameter or architecture search are become becoming automated. 
where do you think we'll go next to get better models? Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, uh, I can maybe make a small comment on that. I mean, the, it's hard to predict, but the bet, for example, even from big companies like Google is it's the following. The cost of paying highly skilled uh, people to come up with architectures we, is higher or will become increasingly higher compared to put just put, throw more computation at it. So if you could say, OK, I, I use the AutoML system and it will, uh, you know, I'll throw a huge amount of computations in to uh, test millions of variations of model architectures. This will eventually be cheaper, and maybe it's already in some scenarios than having you know a highly skilled person thinking a bit, uh, thinking about it for uh, you know three months. So that's that's perhaps where the trend is going. But I see, I, I still think the um, you know this is depending on how you formulate your search space. This can be so huge that you, you we are still not in the regime that you. Fully delegate to a machine, right? Because it's, it's like a huge search space. So I still, I still think it makes sense to have the humans again coming back to geometric deep learning, build, building in this kind of invariances that you know that should hold. So you are not introduce, you are not limiting the scope of like, the hypothesis set. You are not removing functions that uh, you, sh you should be able to learn and uh, dis discarding them, but you are kind of eliminating the things that you know uh, are nonsense, right? So I think you still need the human to reduce the search space of the, of the architectures to a meaningful uh, subset of things. So it's the bitter lesson strikes again. <laughs> <laughs> So actually, one of the responses of, of the better lesson was, uh, I think, called, I think, a better lesson. Yeah. I think it was, that was a, a response. And uh, in, in summary, it was saying that, OK, maybe we are putting the human knowledge not on the model on the features, but on, on some other part of the architecture, maybe choosing the, the data sets. Tuning the data set, or, 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 or right, and there's also lots of work now on data centric uh, AI. So I, I think I think uh, Hugo is, is right. So there's the, the search space is still large, and we are seeing that we are still need to intervene, in deciding the architecture, deciding when to retrain, uh, deciding when to clean things like that. But I also see that the the goal of automating everything. Actually, that's a term that we use at Fizai, auto everything, um, is is there. Uh, it's it's just too appealing to try to to speed up things by throwing more hardware at it. The data center to topic, it's it's good. We should talk a little bit about. It. I don't know if people are interested in the audience. Uh, well, if you have any note on data centric, I think you should take uh, uh, like just go for it. I think it's a very interesting topic. Yeah, so the way I like to think about it is, is, is like this. So you have neural networks are universal, universal function approximators, right? But then, uh, they, so they can learn uh, like uh, very complex representations. So for example, if you have a classific binary classification problem, they have to de de learn a decision boundary. But then you must think of data as constraints. So the putting points of data there they will set the constraints that the representation you learn needs to respect. So, for example, uh, if you have, if you're trying to distinguish, I don't know, boats from cars, uh, and uh, maybe there is a very simple way to cheat. You say, okay, boats mostly have blue background because they are on sea, and cars they have grayish. So the representation, or in this case, the decision boundary that you will learn, will be very bad, even if you have. You know, 10 million pictures of boats on sea and 10 millions of pictures of cars on uh, on the roads. It will still learn something very silly, right? So, so now there are two directions. You can have richer data, more diverse. So uh, maybe you'll have boats on on the road being carried by cars. So you need to learn something a bit more um, elaborate. And then the other thing that was 
I think actually what motivated a lot of progress in deep learning is, is when you scale this to have multi-class. So the revolution that Im ImageNet brought was actually not just because it was more data, it was because you had like a thousand classes. So when you have a thousand classes, you now have to distinguish, uh, you know, half, you have a matrix of a, a thousand by a thousand, but it's like pairwise, it's like symmetric. So you have 500 uh, combinations of pairs of classes you have to distinguish from. So this creates a huge amount of constraints on your representations that can be learned. So now you no longer have to just distinguish between boats and cars. You have to distinguish between boats and whales and whales and dolphins and cars and uh, trucks and bus and uh, different sorts of uh, dog breeds. And because you have to distinguish between all of these pairwise combinations of things, uh, there's fewer and fewer and fewer ways your neural network can cheat, learn, representa uh, learn a representation in which you will get a, a boundary that separates things but is non-meaningful. So one good example I see, I, the best example I think comes to my mind in terms of doing well in data scientific approach is probably with Tesla Autopilot, right? So Andre Karpati, which is now the leader of AI at Tesla, even though they invest a lot of you know, advanced deep learning models and they even have hardware and so on, I think the core of their strategy is to have a good data centric approach in the sense of, okay, they don't need more hours of cars driving in highways in the US. What they need is like edge cases, right? Because they are in the regime, self-driving cars is this regime like data centers. You, want, you need these seven nines of availability, right? You need to get it right 99.9999%, right? Because doing a self-driving car that drives well in a highway, which is the 90%, you can do it uh, in a weekend, right? But if you want to do uh, in secondary roads, if you want to do under snow, if you want to do in, in a messy city, then you need to collect data from these edge cases. And what they did was like a pipeline to trigger the collection of interesting data in the, in the, the regimes in which they are failing the most, right? So for example, there is a car carrying a bike attached to the car and maybe their detectors say, oh, there's a bike on the road. But actually, no, this is like, a, uh, it's a car, it's just that it's carrying a bike. So they are able to trigger uh, uh, and send to the fleet. When you see these kind of events, collect a lot of data here. Mm -hmm. And then it will go to the pipeline of manual and manual and semi-automated, right? And there you can use also the benefit of um, hindsight, right? So you, when you are uh, in doing inference on the car, you need to decide based on those images. But when you are uh, generating training data, okay, you can see the future. For example, if here think this object is not very well visible, you can look a few frames into the future, see what it is and propagate that label back, for example. Yeah. So by doing all of these kind of things, they have set up a strategy in which even if the machine learning model is the same or so, you are gradually expanding how you add more constraints such that the representation is more and more fine-tuned and deals with more and more edge cases. So, and then if we have time, I can tell you the analogy on reinforcement learning to this, but uh, we can, if we have no, time no. for AGI. <laughs> uh, uh, let me just, I suppose we have some questions about AGI. Um, Yes, it's the next question. Uh, uh, yes, let's go to that question. The, the question is, there is a quest for more general AI. How do you see work in this domain? And for instance, the notion of causality as a possible enabler. So hmm. now you may uh, explore this idea of general AI. So yeah, so more general AI, I think it's, uh, it, it's an interesting trend, at least scientifically, I'm not so sure about in terms of applications for companies, because I, I don't, and maybe Pedro will, will, will say I'm wrong, I'm not sure, but because companies typically have a very specific problem to solve if they're solving with AI. And it's not interesting to have a more general AI that simultaneously detects fraud and cleans the floor or something. It, it, you have different uh, systems. For yeah, that. I agree. So, but, what is probably interesting in, in, in the road towards AGI, which I'm, it's not clear what AGI means, what, what do you mean by general? But it's, it's uh, something that is, is, uh, is related to what Hugo was saying, which is dealing, so it's continuous learning, right? It's continual learning, long, lifelong learning 
which humans are very good at, right? You learn new things. So the thing that 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 Hugo was describing is something that humans do effortlessly, right? You see a new case, you had never seen it before, and now you don't forget it anymore. anymore right? you, and and it, it doesn't do any catastrophic forgetting of things you knew before. So I think this is a very important issue for for uh, for, for for making uh, um, artificial intelligence more general is to be able to continue learning while they're they're being used. It's not those not having a clear separation between training and and then using. It has to be like uh, it seems like Tesla has this loop that keeps on updating. And uh, but so it's very important to to deal with these issues of catastrophic forgetting of continuous learning. How to update things? Of course, it's not. It doesn't make sense to update all the weights of the big network every time you see a new example. You have to. So you have maybe need to, to think of more, of more clever ways of of of, of doing uh, learning when you have few. And and another thing which all connected to what Hugo said is uh, active learning. So you need to to select what are the samples that are relevant and they should pay attention to, because there are like edge cases like Hugo mentioned. And it and you shouldn't treat everything equal. So the, all those issues are very important towards generality. Absolutely. Oh, I, I can say that from, uh, from our side, yeah. we actually have a team working on active learning because as what Mario is saying, it's super important to decide what examples matter for our cases. This is especially important in our case where we have domains with very little labels, for example, uh, anti-money laundering cases where there's few uh, labels and the system does not have millions of examples to learn from. So we, we are using active learning there. Uh, so maybe I'll, like, add. I'll add to this, like, so yeah, a, first, AGI was a term in part popularized by Shane Black, which is one of the co-founders of DeepMind. So when he was a PhD student at uh, in Logano, in Switzerland with Markus Uther is in, in Schmiduber's lab. Uh, he actually wrote a paper in 2007 on a collection of definitions of intelligence. So this was just like going to dictionaries and websites and checking what is the definition of intelligence. And even though there is not much agreement, kind of the definition they came up with was intelligence measures an agent's ability to achieve goals, goals in a wide range of environments. So notice that this doesn't have any other complex term like consciousness, uh, sentience, or uh, complex things. It just means measuring an agent's ability to achieve its goals in diverse environments. So this becomes very actionable, right? So the strategy from DeepMind from the beginning was like, okay, so now if we have a method of evaluate agents in diverse environments, we can maybe keep track of uh, how well, how intelligent they are, right? And so they came up with the idea of using these game suites, for example, like Atari's, and they keep increasing the complexity and diversity of games. Why? Because it's easy, to, it's a simulator, it's written by other people, it's not the wrong thing, and the goal is clear, it's like maximize your score. So now you can see, you can see a, a trend here, right? So there are algorithms like uh, DQN and others, which you could say that they are general algorithms that are trained on a, sp uh, a specific domain. So for example, you train for a specific game and you retrain the same algorithm, same parameters in another game. So it's a generally applicable algorithm, but it's not general in the sense that you can play both games. It, it's just trained differently. If you train on all games simultaneously, this problem that Mario mentioned on catastrophic forget forgetting emerges because maybe the network is not able to absorb all the information for all, from all the games, but there are papers there. But now you can see the trend, right? So uh, as you have more and more uh, complex environments, you train the agents to perform more and more diverse, complex tasks. You can see a parallel to what I said before with uh, ImageNet and having multi-class constraints. So if an agent now is trained on, uh, you know, diff different environments, but they have some, perhaps some physical consistency, like the physics simulator is, is the same or, 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 or something like that, but uh, there's a huge diversity of tasks and the agent has to deal with all of the, with all of those. Again, the representation, the internal representations that the agent will learn, like the neural networks, will again have to, are so much more constrained than training in a specific task that you will progressively expand this level of generality, right? Yeah. And this, 
Well, okay, this I can talk about this for hours because this has amazing connections also with, for example, uh, language. So language has uh, typically had this problem of the binding problem, right? You you train a machine uh, language model just on text. But there's no connection to reality, right? So now there's this field in which you actually train uh, language associate bound with the specific environment. So you say, agent, go there and pick the red apple and bring it to that room. So again, you are forcing the the, the agent or the neural network to when he thinks about apple or he thinks about red. It has a direct mapping to the uh, other input uh, modality, which in this case is vision. So you can imagine, uh, for example, uh, our, ourselves, we can, I can immediately formulate a sentence that was never uttered in the history of mankind, right? If I say, there is a extraterrestrial wearing a Benfica shirt at the door and he said, Ola, Ola, Mario, and so on. No, nobody in the history of humankind has ever uttered this sentence until now, right? But all of you could imagine, picture what I was saying, because there is some grounding of the mm -hmm. language terms into some physical object that you understand. Yes. So this is fascinating, right? So once you start training agents in this regime, it's natural that the, the representations that they will learn, which will be mu so much richer than we have now in, in this in these poor and trained regimes, that we will gradually see this AGI taking form of proto AGI, and I'm not talking about you know even superhuman yeah. intelligence or, or a sentience or a consciousness, but it's just this mm -hmm. fact that you learn representations that are much more aligned with the ones that we have, and they generalize much better. To them. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Let me just mention very briefly, just five seconds. If yes. people are interested in this idea of, of what intelligence means, yeah. I recommend. There's a very interesting paper. I think I really agree with what. He wrote by François Cholet called On Measures of Intelligence, mm -hmm. which I think uh, is really worth reading. Very long, but yes. Very long, but really, <laughs> really insightful. He's the, the yeah. author of uh, Carers, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, uh, really can I just say, uh, yeah, 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 Pedro. I think yes. we, are, we, we are, I think, super far away from uh, AGI. Oh, yeah. and, and for me, I would be happy if at least we could. Uh, have models that realize when they have nonsense. Um, for example, you, you probably heard about that um, famous test on, on GPT-3 uh, and that people were feeding the, trying to, to, to prove that it was able to pass the Turing test and people were, were feeding it with silly questions, right? Uh, how, many, how many rainbows does it take to jump from here to 17, for, from Hawaii to 17? What? How many rainbows does it take to jump from a white? Right? The, the sentence does not make sense, right? But it it, it gives an answer. It takes two rainbows. You say, what? <laughs> no, that's not the right answer, right? No number is the right answer. You should, you the right should answer is 42, I thought. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Either that as a joke or, or, or saying, no, nah, that doesn't make sense, right? But but mm -hmm. the model has no no concept of, of, of noise, of silliness, of being tricked or something. And I think that would be, again, yeah. very far away from AGI, but that would be, I think, a, an important first step, or maybe also causality, of course, but even detecting when the, when the model itself is not good. Yes. So, yeah, we could talk about all of these things. We couldn't just uh, talk about a lot of other things. We couldn't touch those topics, but we must finish at some point. Uh, so, um, first of all, I want to inform our audience that the video will be available on YouTube afterwards. So you can share this content if you enjoyed it. You can share this with your friends. Um, also, if you don't want to miss other events that we uh, are preparing for you, just follow, just join our meetup group or follow us on LinkedIn or Twitter. Uh, also, if you have some feedback on the event and you want to help us improve, just fill the form that we uh, that is linked in the description. And I would all I would like to uh, thank the three of you, Hugo, Mario, and Pedro, for uh, accepting this invitation uh, and for being here and sharing your insights on 
all these topics and many more. I, I, I'm sure that you want to share a lot of more knowledge, but unfortunately we have no time. Uh, and I would also like to thank uh, all of the people that joined us uh, online on YouTube. And I want to, um, well, ask you to for feel, feel free to engage with all of the, the deep learning community uh, through the deep learning sessions, Portugal or other uh, groups. And uh, I hope to see all of you in one of our next events that we are preparing. So uh, thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you so much, Luis. Thank, thank you so much. Bye-bye.